No shortage of podcasts here. Mr. Hogger here with the Unit 1 Test Review for Economics. Hope you're doing well out there and having a fantastic day. We're going to cover the key terms and key elements of the first few chapters of economics, starting with which term means the total value of goods produced and services provided in a country during a single year. That's GDP gross domestic product, the total amount of goods and produced services, not partial goods, but completed produced goods and services, one measure and one major and commonly used measure to determine how strong a country's economy is. When we consider the human made resources that are used to create these goods and services, we're talking about capital. When we talk about capital, it's one of the three factors of production. That's land, labor, and capital. Land being all the resources, the energy, and the earth that you need to produce your goods. Labor being all the people and human capital that go into producing these resources. And capital being any other human-made resource that's used to create a good or a service. When we discuss economics, we're almost always talking about decisions that we make choosing one option over another one based on a cost benefits or whatever analysis they put into it. And when we give up one choice or option by making another one, when we sacrifice the value of one choice by not choosing it and choosing something else, we refer to that as opportunity cost. What's the value of the choice that you didn't make? Did you opt to continue your education or did you go right into the career field? Is there an opportunity cost there? Did you choose pepperoni pizza over sausage? The opportunity cost would be the sausage. And no one likes it when you pick the wrong food, right? Which economics term means the skills and knowledge gained by a worker through education and experience? That's human capital. And that's what sets the United States apart from many other countries. There are some countries like Japan that have a really high GDP, but they don't have natural resources to exploit. However, they have very skilled and knowledgeable workforce and members that can produce an amazing amount of technical goods at a high level of expertise through a high level of educational experience. You're talking about human capital. How much skill do the average worker have in particular countries? And how much expertise does that country contain? It all depends on their human capital. In that example there, Japan maybe can't get as much natural resource from the area that they live in. They do have access to water and sea, but when it comes to land, the United States has a lot more natural resources to produce its goods and its services. It's a tremendous asset, and that term that refers to natural resources is land. We spend a lot of time in this unit talking about how in the United States, a lot of people are doing different work. They have specialization. They split at some point into a separation of workers in American history. But it's more than just people work in different locations. It's a division of labor. We have an amazing labor force where we have experts in education. I don't know who I might be talking about there. You know, just a little self-flattery. We have experts in food production. We have experts in sports and professional athletes. That's a division of labor. People chose to specialize and become experts in their field. That's the division of labor that occurs when markets create opportunities for people. And economically, people choose to go into certain industries and become experts. Division of labor. In more traditional economies where you don't have division of labor, or even if you do, you don't have a large gross domestic product and a huge trading system, what you might do in a more tribal location is bartering. That's when you directly trade goods and services for others without the exchange of cash. I have enjoyed a barter in my past. I love performing my music, and I love performing on stage. And when I was able to barter services for guitar uh, endorsements in the past, it worked out for both parties. They got exposure for their brand. I love playing their instruments and speak highly of them in public and it's created a resource for me to save money and save cash while providing an exchange of goods and services and it's commonly done in the entertainment arts now let's get into some short conversation for some short answer how does trade make people off well very simply put when people trade with experts who've specialized or have division of labor you get goods that are better for you than if you tried to make them themselves i use the example in class that if i designed my own clothing it would probably not be of the highest quality and i would look a little bit raggedy and it wouldn't be a great presentation if i had to sew my own clothes clothing rarely goes into what we would call scarcity in the united states we always seem to have an abundance but if something happened to our cotton production lines or the cotton production of the world we 
would enter into scarcity, where there would be a, sh a permanent shortage or a long-term shortage of a good or a service becoming available. The price would probably rise. The demand would probably uh, either stay the same or increase, but there would be less of a resource available to us. A long-term example might be the oil that's necessary to refine for gasoline. We know that there's a limited supply and it'll take an extremely long time to replenish that natural supply. So if we were all to start using 10 times more gas every day, we would soon know the term scarcity because there would only be so much to go along. Luckily for us, we have so many specialized labor forces that do such a great job supplying us that we very rarely have shortages that turn into scarcity in the United States because people have specialized. They have become experts in a particular field and gained experience and knowledge that have made them specialists. And specialization can lead to economic interdependence because if Germany is a expert in luxury automobiles, then we can trade and buy German products like German cars. We could also choose to buy American brands. But German manufacturers and Europeans might like Ford because the Ford Fiesta was one of the best-selling cars in Europe for its gas efficiency, for its size, and for its portability. So with specialization, the world can trade and get special products that they think have advantages from different countries. We can import certain fruits from South America and we can grow others. We can get certain technology from the United States and we can import others. We can pick and choose from the world's products and that creates an interdependence of all the products of the world. And people and nations gain from this specialization because they're able to get goods from all over the world that are produced that maybe they can't produce in their own country for a variety of reasons. And trade makes us wealthier because when buyers are paired with sellers, economies prosper. Gross domestic products grow, trade increases, and makes us wealthier as individuals or as businesses or as countries. Now that's, that's a little bit of an example of a market economy where there are exchanges of international businesses and organizations and governments and countries. A traditional economy would be different than a market economy because there probably is going to be a lower gross domestic product. They're probably more interested in subsistence and survival and trade in the local community than it would be at an international rate. And a traditional economy would not really be prepared if there is a scarcity or a change in, in demand or supply and could be more vulnerable and could possibly have a lower quality of life. But when we discuss the United States and why we have a relative strong economy to the rest of the world, there are a lot of indicators that you might discuss. And I ask my students to consider three. You might talk about the high gross domestic product. You might talk about that we went over the top 10 industries in class and students were surprised to learn like how much we manufacture in organic chemicals, plastics, gems, vehicles, aircrafts, mineral fuels, electrical machinery, or technology. And it is quite impressive to consider. You might discuss that we have a really strong network of partners and allies and that goods come out and go into our country daily. You might discuss that uh, geographically we have a lot of land and as that factor of production we can produce a lot of energy and resources and minerals and products and agriculture. So any of one of those things could be great and I ask my students for three but whatever your, your teacher is asking for certainly a breadth of understanding there could get you a firm start in your review for unit one and we are done. There is no shortage of good information. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment on YouTube or go to hoggerhistory.podbean.com. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and we'll see you next time you're in class. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful day and thanks for listening to the Hogger History Podcast. <laughs>